Um, so I'm Dan Perry. I'm uh, also a kids orthopaedic surgeon at Alderhey Children's Hospital. Um, I work um, partly at Alderhey. I also work um, at the University of Oxford, where I'm a professor. And uh, I'm the paediatric editor for the Bone and Joint Journal. So, uh, so if you send papers to us, they'll, they'll almost certainly come through me. So, 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 so I'll either take the credit or I apologise in advance, depending if I've been kind to you. So, uh, so I work at Alderhey, uh, it's in Liverpool. Liverpool's an awesome place to, to live and work. And Liverpool grew up around the docks. So we were uh, the capital of shipping for, 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 many, uh, for many years. Uh, and consequently, we've got, now got beautiful docklands, um, but, but the whole shipping industry really grew orthopedics in the city. Um, and we've talked about the Thomas Blimp with Mr. Pryor, but Hugh Owen Thomas worked here at Alderhey Children's Hospital, uh, along, with, uh, along with Sir Robert Jones. So you've heard of Jones fractures, you've heard of Jones splints. We're, we're in very good company where we are at the moment. Uh, and this is our old hospital, but, you've, uh, but Mr. Walton's just shown you our beautiful new hospital where, where I am at the moment. Um, so, so loads of history here with Professor McMurray being the, the, the first um, or the second professor of orthopedics in the world after, uh, after Girdlestone in, in Oxford. So, uh, so I feel quite lucky that, that I work at Alderhey as a, as a professor of orthopedic surgery uh, and I've got links to Oxford so, uh, so I can bring it all together. When I started doing research in children's orthopedic surgery, everyone told me it was going to be impossible. Um, it's going to be impossible because everything is too rare, um, because the parents will never agree, uh, and because it's unethical. People told me it was unethical to do research in children's orthopedics. So yeah, I said, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't think your slides are moving forward. Oh, are they not? No, sorry. It's still yeah, on it's the first. The first, uh, first slide, sir. Your slides are not working. No, oh, no. Let me try again. Uh, yes, yes. See that? Yes, it's working now. Is it working? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you missed all the pretty pictures. Oh, well, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so, so when I started doing research in children's orthopedic surgery, everyone told me it was going to be impossible. Everything's too rare. Uh, the parents won't agree. Uh, and it's unethical. It's unethical to do research in children. So we started really simply. We started in the UK saying, OK, um, so let's not try and go for a really complex study, like a, a trial, like a randomized control trial. Let's just do a big observational study and see if we can get people to work together. So it's, we started with a study called BOSS, which is the British Orthopedic Surgery Surveillance Study. It was a really simple cohort study. So all we said is over the course of a year or 18 months, let's get together uh, all the cases of Sufi and Perthes disease in the UK. Um, but let's do a bit more than that. Let's be beautiful. Let's make it massive. Let's involve every single hospital in the UK that treats these, the, these uh, conditions. So 143 hospitals. And let's challenge how research gets done. Let's get rid of all the paper and let's do everything online. Uh, let's, do, let's use a lot of routine data to inform what we're doing. Uh, and using that, we, we, we did amazingly well. Over the course of a year, we got a thousand new cases between uh, between slipped capital femoral epiphysis and between Perthes disease. So a thousand new cases in the UK over that one year period. We've now got the results and, and, and we're just about to publish the, the results of, uh, of these studies. So really powerful, loads and loads of cases, no, no time at all, just because people were working together. Uh, and that really allowed us to, to start doing cleverer stuff and start doing, doing better studies. So what seemed impossible was suddenly becoming possible. So at that time, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK um, published a report about the, the management of non-complex fractures. Uh, and in that report, they spoke about these fractures, these fractures that we as orthopedic surgeons probably don't care about that much. Um, so simple torus fractures. So they, they published about torus fractures and they said that, look, we don't really know how best to treat torus fractures. Some people treat them in a cast, some people treat them in a splint. Some people perhaps don't even treat them at all. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I think your slides are not running. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. Dan, have, yeah. You got, have you got a touch screen? Yeah, no. Ah, OK. That was the only way I could get mine to work. So I had to sort of drag them over. Uh, is it working like this? Can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. You can see that, yeah. So if I do that, is that working? Yeah, 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 it's working. Okay, let's. Uh, it's a bit more random. Let's do it like this. Um, tell me if it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's working. So now. we started looking at torus fractures. So what you think may think may be the, the the most least important fractures in the world, but in terms of research, in terms of doing research well, 
if you pick a fracture that no one cares about to start researching your country, then you can get loads of people on board all together uh, and they can unite around a fracture that they don't really care about that much. Uh, and and there's, no, there's no big egos, there's no big issues. So we got loads of children together and we said, look, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, so I want to do a study around, around the management of torus fractures. It's a fracture that, that we as orthopedic surgeons probably don't care about that much, but they're really common. We know there's 60,000 of them in the UK every year. So, so we said that the National Institute of Clinical Excellence want to do a, fracture, a study about whether they need any treatment at all. And the kids said, well, you need at least a bandage. And the parents said, you need at least a bandage. We're not going to accept nothing. So we, we created an elaborate study. We, we set up a text messaging system where we, we texted the children and texted their parents uh, at different time points and worked out that text message follow-up was really good um, for following up children. Uh, and uh, over the course of... Uh, over the course of a few weeks at Alder Hay Hospital, we did a really simple audit, just looking at their pain scores over the course of six weeks, demonstrating that text messages worked really, really well, um, uh, and that their pain is, is pretty much gone by six weeks. So from that, we came up with a force study, which is the forearm fracture recovery in children evaluation. Um, a really simple randomized controlled trial, uh, randomizing patients with the offer of a bandage. So patients told us you need at least a bandage. So we'll either do immobilization so either put it in a cast or a splint or whatever we do at the moment or we'll randomize them to the offer of a bandage so here's your bandage take it home wear it if you want to i don't really care if you don't wear it just just here's a bandage you, you told us you wanted a bandage you, you have it um, and it was almost completely online trial it was beautiful online randomization online consent online questionnaires online text message follow-up uh, and online patient information um, and this was the course of this study it was amazing. The study just finished. I can't tell you the result. I do know the result, but we randomized a thousand patients uh, over the course of uh, about 12, 18 months or so. Uh, so a really big study, probably the biggest, biggest randomized control trial that's ever been done in children's orthopedic surgery. And we did it because we used loads of, loads of technology. We got loads of centers together. It was well-funded because we've got the government on board. So we got 750,000 pounds to, to make the study run. And it was really cool. Um, and it's probably going to be one of the, the only, one of the first studies in one of the really big medical journals like JAMA or the New England Journal, which is really cool. Um, so the first study was our, so the BOSS study was how we started research. The fourth study was how we started randomized control trials. Uh, and from then we've gone from strength to strength. So we asked the British Society of Children's Orthopedic Surgery, okay, we're getting kind of okay at research now. So what are our big questions? What are our big questions in children's trauma? And a lot of questions in children's trauma about medial the condyle fractures. Do we operate or do we not operate? About femoral fractures, how do we treat them? So, so Mr. Pryor's already talked a little bit about that, but there's lots of controversy. Same as tibial shaft fractures, offended distal radius fractures, and minimally displaced tibial, um, uh, distal tibial fractures. So we got our priority list and we shouted about it lots. Uh, and the National Institute of Health Research, uh, they, they, they said, well, Good job, well done. You know, you've done well on the simple fractures, the torus fractures. Have some more money and start doing really big studies well. Um, and so that's when we came up with the science study. And so this is my favorite study because it's got a really cool name. Um, so it's surgery or casts for injuries of the epicondyle in children's elbows. So a study about medial epicondyle fractures. So we all know that this medial epicondyle fracture may come to your, your clinic tomorrow. And you know that you're not sure whether you should operate on it or, or, or you shouldn't operate on it. You'll have fixed opinions either way, but you know in your heart that you, you, you don't really know how best to treat it. Uh, and we know in the UK that half of surgeons operate and half of surgeons don't operate. Uh, and whether they operate or not doesn't really depend on anything in particular. It may be the direction of the wind. It may be what they've had for breakfast. Um, but there's no real orthopedic literature that's going to tell us whether we should or shouldn't operate on this. We know the systematic reviews and all of the evidence is entirely equivocal. Some people argue better stability and faster stabilization fixing it. Some people say, well, if you put a screw in it, the screw is probably gonna to have to come out. Some evidence that they get more long-term pain and there's no real evidence that they've got better stability. So it's all very, very controversial. So the plan is simple. Is surgery better than no surgery? So in the UK, we've had a trial funded which has cost the UK government 1.2 million pounds. It's a multi-center prospective randomized superiority trial of, of fixation versus non-operative treatment for medial epicondyle fractures. Um, 
Uh, so, so it's about displaced medial epicondyle fractures. So what's displaced? Well, broadly, displaced is anything you can see on an X-ray. Uh, and so people argue about whether two millimeters is displaced, three millimeters displaced, a centimeters displaced. But we know from the literature uh, and we know from some really nice studies that even if you've got a fracture which, which looks undisplaced on X-ray, if you do a CT, it can be up to a centimeter displaced. And we also know that medial epicondyle fractures are fractures that kind of, we know that the bone just gets pulled off. So in one minute on one view, you've got a fracture that's, that's undisplaced and you may rotate the arm a little and it may be displaced. So it kind of doesn't make sense to do this measurement thing that we all like to do, that, that doesn't make sense. They're either displaced or they're not displaced. So anything that's displaced on X-ray is in. And so what about dislocated elbows? So people talk about dislocated elbows and talk about the, the fact that perhaps they, they, they would benefit more from fixation. But there's no real evidence of that. that. That's just kind of what people think and what people may believe. But if you look at the literature, these, these, whether an elbow is dislocated initially or not dislocated initially, it doesn't really make a difference. It shouldn't really push you one way or the other. So we've got an un all online trial about, me about medial epicondyle fractures, so displaced medial epicondyle fractures, fixation versus no fixation, and we're stratifying um, by whether they were, whether they were um, uh, uh, dislocated initially. So that stratification means that we're gonna equally balance whether they were dislocated initially in the two groups to, to make it fair. It's a beautiful online trial, online randomization, online consent, online questionnaires, online text messages, online patient information. Um, you can go and check out our website. So our website costs us loads of money because it's beautiful. It really gets patients on boards. Um, it's called sciencestudy.org. Um, and, it, and it really explains the, the whole trial well to families in beautiful cartoons. Um, our recruitment, so this was our predicted recruitment curve. Uh, our recruitment's not quite going to plan with COVID, um, but so far we've randomized 100 patients, um, 90, 98 patients uh, in the study. So, so randomized between the two interventions. We need 330. Um, so we're opening sites. Uh, so we've opened 60 sites in the UK. So 60 hospitals in the UK are participating. Uh, we're just about to open in New Zealand and just about to open in Australia. And the US will find out next week if they've been funded in the study as well. So, so there's loads of activity going on. It's really cool. So that's the science study. Um, and then we've moved on. Um, so so we, we, we really involve children in, in the way that we do research because that's how the, the big funders in the UK will, will start to listen to us and start to engage with, with funding the big research projects that we need. Um, and so our next study is about pediatric wrist fractures uh, and that's called CRAFT, so craftstudy.org. So um, you all know, so you all look at fractures like this. So, so, this, so this was a fracture that was on social media recently. Uh, so this was a fracture that was treated in a cast, a distal radius fracture. Uh, and so this guy on, on put this fracture on LinkedIn. Uh, and the chap got loads of abuse um, by putting this fracture on LinkedIn. Um, he, he got lots of abuse from different trauma surgeons around the world. So I'm sorry if you're one of these trauma surgeons that was giving this guy abuse. Um, he said that lots of people said this fracture will never heal spontaneously correct. It's too angulated. The damage to the cartilage is done. It's the, 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 the damage is not recoverable. We must abandon this concept that fractures will always reshape. It's absolutely untrue. Well, of course, the guy had, had set, set himself up. You know, he showed this one day. He received all of the abuse. And the next day, he showed this three months later. Of course, three months later, this fracture was beautifully, beautifully healed. And of course, it was well on the way to remodeling. Because we know that fractures in children, we know that they remodel beautifully. And we have to pick out which fractures and we have to pick out what we do. But we know that we're probably too aggressive. Certainly in the UK, we're really aggressive in the treatment of distal radius fractures when perhaps we don't need to be. I'm not quite sure how it is in, in Egypt and across the world, but I know that in the UK, Australia, New Zealand and the US who are really participating in our studies at the moment, we're really too aggressive. Uh, and we know that from the Hawaii study. So, so you've probably seen these x-rays from the Hawaii study. So this is a, a, a child, I think he was about eight years old. Um, he was put in a cast, so just a, uh, put in a simple cast with some dimorphine just to, to, to make it reasonably straight. Uh, this is three months later when he came out of cast, uh, and this is two years later. So his offended distal radius fracture just beautifully grew straight because kids are cool, kids are magical, kids do that. We don't need to be so aggressive. 
Uh, and so this is what's known as the Y study. So, so published in the Bone and Joint Journal of America. So, so, so I'm sorry, it's uh, I'm sorry, it's in the American edition. But, uh, but hey, the the BJJ would have been a better place for it. But, but who am I to say? Um, so, so our study is called the Craft Study. So it's very much based on that that Craft that Hawaii paper. Um, so we're asking: Is casting without reduction as good as casting with reduction? So we've got beautiful online material um, to, to get the parents on board and we need 775 fractures um, uh, to really definitively answer this research question. Um, uh, this probably won't work given our technology so far, but I'll just show you briefly how we really get parents on board and, and, and why the trials cost so much money. And it's all about the, the kind of quality of the information we're giving to parents. The craft study is trying to find out the best way to treat children who have broken their arm and the bones have moved out of place. The study is comparing the two most common treatments used throughout the UK. One treatment is to put the arm in a plaster cast for four to six weeks. There is evidence that children's bones will naturally grow straight, though their arm may look a little bent for a few months, which can be distressing to some parents or children. Healing may take longer, and in rare cases, an operation may be required. The other treatment is to put the bones back into the right position first before putting the arm in a plaster cast. Children will be sedated or given a general anaesthetic so they can't feel anything. Sometimes a cut needs to be made in the arm to insert plates or wires to hold the bones in position. Occasionally the bones may move out of place or there may be an infection. Both may require further treatment. In the craft study, half the children will have their broken bones straightened naturally in a cast, and half will have their broken bone put back in position under sedation or during an operation. To make things fair, the treatment will be decided using a computer. If you join the craft study, we'll ask you questions about how your child uses the arm, any pain they feel, and if they've missed any school. We will send these questions by text message or by email. We'll ask you questions five times in the first year, then once a year for three years. The doctors, nurses and research team are happy to answer any questions that you may have about joining the craft study. So that's one of our one of our cool studies um, uh, and, um, and I'm really pleased to be able to kind of share with you what, what we're doing. Um, so it's about it's about these offended distal radius fractures. Well, it's, well it's, it's more than that, actually. So it's about displaced distal radius fractures that, that we, the surgeon, think might need to go to theatre so they can be salt Harris II or metaphyseal fractures between four and 10 years old, and we're stratifying them by the degree of translation. So we, we, we need at least 200 completely offended fractures, uh, and we're, we're making sure that we've got the, the, the group's balance to, to make the whole study fair. Interventions about um, casting uh, without GA of sedation. Um, uh, uh, sorry, the non-operative intervention is about casting without GI sedation, and the operative intervention uh, is, is about conscious sedation or GA plus or minus fixation. Um, so we're going to follow them up by text messages and email because we know from the force study it, it works. Um, uh, and so the craft study is magical. It's going to change orthopedics probably across the world. Uh, it's really, really cool. Uh, and now it's, um, so it's re only relatively recently started and it's recruited about 35 children in the UK. Uh, and, uh, and we've got about 20 sites on board uh, and we're, we're opening steadily. Um, but as soon as spring and summer hits, I'm really hoping that this study is going to take off because uh, that's our fracture season, that's our trampoline season. So it's officially, uh, officially open. So in research, what have I learned? Well, I've learned that having that research agenda was really cool. So, so having that research agenda that the British Society of Children's Orthopaedic Surgery made to say, look, these are our key priorities, that, that was really cool. And starting off with really low hanging fruits, a really simple fracture that, that people don't really care about to get everyone on board, or even better, start, start off with that simple cohort to get all the surgeons together. That was really key to create a, this really nice community ethos. You've got to stay focused on your agenda, you've got to do cool stuff. So, all these online videos, online consent, and all the text message follow up, it's really cool and, and, and everyone loves it. Getting children on board, so parent and, and, uh, parent and uh, public participation is a really big win. Certainly in the UK, that's how you get children on board and, and that's how you get the buy into your studies. And you have to have a really nice branding. So you need, the, you need surgeons around the world to buy into your mission to what you're doing. And that's why we spend £20,000 on the websites that each of the websites that I create, 
I spend huge amounts of money making them beautiful to get the buying that I need. And of course, you've got to get lucky. I've been in the right place at the right time. So what seemed impossible is possible. Um, the UK, UK trauma is definitely, for kids, is, is, is leading the way now in, in research. Children's trauma research is officially possible. And our UK collaborative is, 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 is very much world leading, which I'm delighted by. We've been joined by New Zealand, Australia, the US, Canada, uh, and I'm very happy to, 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 to embrace worldwide collaboration. Uh, we, we as a nation, as a, as a world, need to embrace our collective uncertainty and move forwards. Um, these are the studies that, so FORCE has just finished, science is, is midway, CRAFT is in the early stages. Uh, and what I can tell you is that, that another study has just been funded, which is a, about slip to pyphosis, so another 1.2 million pound study. Uh, and a study about, uh, about uh, distal radius fractures was actually considered by one of the funding committees yesterday for another, uh, another big slug of cash. So, uh, so there's loads going on, um, and I want, uh, I want the world to embrace the collective uncertainty, and, and if I can help in any way, just let us know. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Perry, for this uh, very valuable talk about randomized uh, researches in uh, pediatric orthopedics. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Sheikh, you are the moderator with uh, Professor Daniel Perry. Yeah, thanks, Prof. Uh, for this kind, of, um, it's it's a very uh, different presentation about what what are what's going on at the moment, and uh, what's um, what's more interesting that it's how simple are these ideas. We are not looking for sophisticated things or uh, uh, complex things. Uh, they are very simple decisions that till the moment we still don't have the uh, evidence base for that. And hopefully, from your work and from all the people who are helping with you, we find some uh, evidence for these simple questions. Um, I don't have any questions from the floor, but I think we have uh, done a great night uh, with all guys from Liverpool. Um, thanks so much um, and hope you, you enjoyed this night also. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmad. Finally, uh, I would like to thank so much our eminent guest speakers.